record right now. Um, so if you could keep yourselves on mute, unless you're asking a question, that would be great. And I'm gonna hand it over to Heather Brown. Sorry about that, something weird just happened. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to tonight's training, um, which is an overview of the model battery energy storage system law. Um, I'm Heather Brown. I'm the deputy commissioner for the Sullivan County Division of Planning, Community Development and Environmental Management. And I oversee the activities um, in the Sullivan County Office of Sustainable Energy. And uh, very happy to be once again, partnering with um, my colleagues in the planning department and um, our colleagues at NYSERDA to bring this free, these free training opportunities that are focusing on clean energy to our municipal leaders. Um, many thanks to Cassandra for all of her um, hard work that makes all of the setting up for this look effortless. Um, it's not, but she makes it look easy. Um, our goal is to provide training to all of you that is timely and relevant to issues that are uh, impacting, that are currently impacting local governments. And I think that tonight's training kind of falls directly into that line. Um, battery storage is rising in popularity right now. It's driven by state goals and policies, as well as a declining cost of the technology. Um, we want to make sure that municipalities have an opportunity to get out in front of projects before we're actually seeing them proposed um, at the local levels, before they're coming before your planning boards and your zoning boards or town boards or whatnot. We wanna make sure that you are aware of these projects and how you can uh, plan for them uh, in your own municipal zoning. Um, I will just note that Sullivan County is an active participant in ISERTA's Clean Energy Communities Program. Um, we were designated as a clean energy community in 2017. Um, the Clean Energy Communities pr Program provides local governments across New York State with tools and resources to achieve their clean energy goals. Um, the training that you are receiving tonight is being made available through this training initiative. Um, if you're not uh, signed up already, with the Clean Energy Communities uh, Program, um, I would highly recommend looking into it. Um, we're planning to have additional trainings related to clean energy throughout the year, but we will be taking a break from the trainings um, until probably about September. Uh, we know you all get very busy during the summer months, just the uh, kind of nature of our area, and uh, this tends to be our busy season. So we'll be starting things back up probably in September. Um, so be on the lookout for that probably around uh, August, you'll start seeing information about that. Um, just a couple of quick housekeeping items. Um, participants in tonight's training will receive two training credits. Um, certificates will be sent to your uh, respective clerks within the next two weeks. If you would like a copy for yourself, you can email planning directly. We'll be sure to get that to you. Also, the 2022 round of funding through the consolidated funding application is currently open. Um, there's funding available for comprehensive planning uh, via both the New York State Department of State as well as the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. Um, given that there was uh, training just provided about incorporating clean energy into your comprehensive plans, that may be something that uh, some of your municipalities might have interest in. Um, I will also say that Department of State also has um, funding that is available to help with updating your zoning laws. Um, planning sends out updates via eBlast on a pretty regular basis about these opportunities. Um, so if you're not already signed up for that e-blast, you may want to consider, and I believe Cassandra, correct me if I'm wrong, but on June 1st at 11 o'clock, there will be um, a, a, a Zoom or a webinar um, being provided to Sullivan County um, with more information about the resources available through this, this year's round of CFA um, resources. Um, so all that being said, um, unless there's anything that I missed, Cassandra, we're good. Nope, we're good. And I will nope, drop the good. link to that CFA uh, Q&A webinar session in the chat. Perfect. Um, with that, I'm going to introduce our trainer for the evening. Um, we're very pleased to introduce Ian Latimer. Ian is a senior project manager with the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. Uh, we always refer to as NYSERDA. Um, they're clean energy siting and innovation teams where he works directly with communities, local governments, and industry stakeholders to pursue responsible siting and installation practices for clean energy technologies. Ian's responsibilities include developing resources and trainings for local governments. Sorry, just lost my spot. Uh, including developing resources and training for local governments pertaining to clean energy development for uh, supporting NYSERDA's annual large-scale renewable solicitations and helping municipal officials navigate project siting and zoning considerations. More recently, Ian was tasked with leading NYSERDA's stakeholder engagement activities to support the growth of New York's clean hydrogen industry, which is very exciting, and was a 2020 fellow with the Clean Energy Leadership Institute. Ian, thank you so much for joining us tonight, and I will let you take it from here. 
Dream. Thanks, Heather. Uh, thanks, Cassandra, and the whole Sullivan County team for, for having me out tonight. Um, sorry to hear that there won't be any training until the fall. Seems like I should go into hibernation and I'll emerge back out in the fall to come rejoin you guys for some training. Um, uh, yeah, as, as Heather said, my name is Ian. Uh, I'm really pleased to be here with you guys. Um, I have been getting to do fewer of these trainings as of late, so it's, it's very exciting for me to, to get to be with you. Um, or that we were in person, but I know everyone likes to be in the, the comfort of their own home, so happy to be with you either way. Um, I will go ahead and share my screen and pull up the, the presentation for uh, this evening's course. You guys give me a, a thumbs up if you're able, make sure it looks okay. Perfect. Uh, well, that's me, Ian Latimer, Senior Project Manager at NYSERDA. Um, as I mentioned to Heather earlier, uh, you know, this course tends to run a few minutes under two, so I welcome any and all questions uh, pertaining to the material presented therein. Um, please make liberal use of the, the chat or Q&A features in the Zoom tonight, and we'll be happy to address those questions primarily at the end, but if there's anything particularly pressing um, that you want to make sure we're getting throughout, um, if it would help you understand what we're going through, please feel free to make note of that in the chat, and we'll do my best to answer those questions. Um, what else? Uh, if you have any questions, as, as Heather, Heather mentioned, I'm also working on hydrogen, which, though not a battery, also has energy storage implications. So if you want to talk hydrogen at all, maybe we'll wait till the end of the, the presentation, but happy to, to address that as well. Um, we have a shared mailbox that reaches um, myself and my colleagues on the Clean Energy Siting Team, which is cleanenergyhelp at nyserta.ny.gov. You'll see that here, as well as later in the presentation. Uh, any and all questions, uh, please feel free to reach out. We're always happy to help and provide assistance to our municipalities across the state. So uh, with that, what else can I say? Um, most of the photos throughout the presentation, I try and utilize photos of actual New York technolo uh, technology installations. So most of the battery storage system photos you'll be seeing tonight are New York installations. Not all of them, but many of them. Um, I think that's kind of it as far as the overview. Um, for, let's see here, but you know what we'll be covering tonight. Uh, so we'll start with an introduction to battery energy storage systems and the technologies that we're talking about when we talk about BESS or BESS. Um, from there, give you an overview of the New York State goals, programs, and policies, which are supporting and driving the battery energy storage industry in New York State. Um, from there, move on to the bread and butter of tonight's presentation, which is an overview of our battery energy storage system model law, which is a template zoning ordinance, which is highly customizable for municipalities to plan and regulate uh, battery installations in their community. Uh, we'll provide an overview of fire safety considerations for battery energy storage systems, and then we'll have an opportunity for Q&A at the end, like I said. Um, Battery energy storage is one of the core technologies that makes up our portfolio of resources for communities and local governments on the siting team. Um, as you heard from my colleague recently, you know, we've got this clean energy in your comprehensive plan resource, which is designed to help communities think proactively around clean energy technologies. Uh, the other guidebooks that you see pictured on the screen here are much more technology focused. So we have our solar guidebook, which many of you may be familiar with, including the model solar law. Uh, the Battery Energy Storage System Guidebook, I'd say, is the thinnest of the three, um, just relative to the, the maturity of the technology and how many installations we've seen to date. Um, but it does still contain some really relevant information, which we'll be covering uh, this, this evening. We also have the Wind Energy Guidebook, but um, that one, I would say, is utilized less than the solar and storage ones based on the challenges around siting wind projects. Uh, and the, the number of projects that we're seeing proposed in the state, which favor batteries and solar much more than they do wind, um, at least onshore wind. Um, yep, so that's me. That's my contact info. It's in the slides, which I will share with uh, the county for distribution um, or for posting. So feel free to reach out to me or the team at any time. Uh, starting with the introduction to battery energy storage systems, and actually one thing while, while I pause you know, up front, I would be really curious to know, um, you know from the folks in attendance, what, if any, your familiarity from a planning perspective or from a municipal perspective is with regard to battery energy storage systems. So if you've got a proposed project in your community or if you've heard rumblings of you know, a project that may be proposing an application to the planning board, um, let us know in the chat. I'd be very curious to hear and maybe I can ask. Um, the Sullivan County team, you know, if we get any responses in there to just uh, shout them out because I'm, I'm curious. Uh, so introduction to battery energy storage systems. We're going to lose a couple of those words and zoom in and talk about energy storage. What does that mean? Um, so energy storage utilizes the concept of potential energy. Um, it allows you to store and then utilize energy at a later date or time um, based on, you know, when that energy may be needed. 
Um, and there's a few different types of battery energy storage systems that can store different, or energy storage systems rather, that can store different types of stored energy. So there's electrical or electrochemical energy storage, which utilizes the chemical properties of different metals and materials to store and then disperse energy. There's also gravitational energy storage, um, which we'll, we'll talk a little bit about these sort of different types in just a minute. Um, mechanical energy storage, which utilizes um, mostly gravity or inertia um, as a way of uh, utilizing kinetic energy um, or storing kinetic energy. And then thermal energy, which relies on uh, temperature. And it utilizes the uh, energy that is exchanged by the conversion of things from hot to cold or cold to hot, um, which itself releases energy. And these energy storage types are reiterated in a few different types of energy storage systems. So an example of, um, on the top left, an example of energy storage is the pumped hydroelectric energy storage systems, which I would say are probably the, the on, on like on the, in terms of large scale, this is probably the largest scale type of energy storage system that we see used today. Um, so pumped hydroelectric, the New York example would be the Blenheim Gilboa pumped hydroelectric storage facility, which utilizes gravity by pumping, uh, pumping water up to a high reservoir during times when electricity prices are low, and then releasing that water to flow through turbines to create electricity um, during times of peak demand when grid uh, electricity prices are particularly high, or there's just not enough electricity on the grid to meet peak demand. Usually that's you know, 5, 6 p.m. when everybody's coming home and turning on their TVs and plugging in their microwaves and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, the challenges with pumped hydroelectric, even though they're really, really efficient, and once they're built, they're a really great asset, um, building a pumped hydroelectric facility is a huge pain from a siting perspective. Um, anyone that's familiar with the creation of new hydroelectric assets is familiar that, uh, you know, creating new reservoirs, damming up rivers, doing all of those types of things are incredibly challenging from a siting perspective and an environmental perspective. Um, there is some really interesting innovation work happening around pumped hydroelectric using existing land, um, using existing like, uh, the, the main one that I'm familiar with is like coal plants or sorry, coal mines, where you can utilize the gravitational difference between the entrance to the mine and lower as a way of generating, um, you know, creating a space where water can flow up and down um, and then utilizing that. But other than that, those sort of innovations, uh, you don't see too much in the way of new pumped hydroelectric facilities these days. Um, on the top right, you see an example of a mechanical energy storage system, which is usually referred to as a flywheel, although sometimes can also include compressed air energy storage. Um, that utilizes a actual mechanical activity um, to store and create uh, electricity or, or energy rather. Um, so an example of a flywheel is during times of, uh, you know, low energy prices or excess energy um, on the grid, they will charge up that flywheel, which utilizes a uh, basically a zero gravity chamber at which you can rotate a very heavy mass, um, which will stay rotating for a long time if it's charged up. And then during times when you need that energy, you can uh, release it back in from the energy stored up in this, uh, in this spinning heavy mass uh, as mechanical energy. The main type of energy storage system that we're going to be talking about this evening is electrochemical and namely batteries. Um, and so that means there's a few different types that we're talking about, but mostly we'll focus on lithium ion batteries, which is the prevailing electrochemistry for batteries today. Uh, lithium ion batteries are neither new nor niche. Um, the laptop I'm speaking to you through, the phone that I carry around in my, my pocket every day, um, those use lithium ion batteries, as do your electric vehicles and, you know, other other novel types of batteries. Um, lithium ion batteries have tremendous potential as a grid asset and an energy storage uh, mechanism for you know, pairing with renewables. And we're really going to talk about why that is and why we're seeing those deployed across the state today. Um, in, a different, in addition to lithium ion, there are other electrochemistries. Uh, lead acid batteries are the types of batteries that are in our car. Those are pretty familiar to a lot of people and have been pretty utilized in battery rooms that, you know, uh, uh, data centers and warehouses. Um, there's other electrochemistries as well. There's also flow batteries, which utilize a, a much larger amount of liquid electrolyte and are able to generate electricity based on the flow of that electrolyte from the anode to the cathode. Um, but again, flow batteries are not super common in terms of what we're seeing deployed, so it won't be a focus of this evening. Um, I mentioned thermal energy storage, uh, which again relies mostly on temperature exchange as a way of storing and then uh, 
distributing or uh, dispersing electricity. Um, so there's a few different types of thermal storage, but again, not something that we're seeing deployed in New York State, so it won't be a focus. And then finally, chemical energy storage, namely hydrogen, um, which I mentioned at the top. Uh, hydrogen offers potential as an energy storage mechanism because you can create it using excess electricity and then run it through a fuel cell or combust it to create energy on the backside. So there's a couple of couple of options for how you can use hydrogen as an energy storage mechanism. But again, tonight we are uh, focused mostly on battery energy storage systems. So we talked about energy storage. We talked a little bit about energy storage systems. I'm going to talk about battery energy storage next. So what are we talking about when we talk about battery energy storage? Um, Mentioned that it can contain a few different types of electrochemistries, but again, we're mostly focused on lithium ion, uh, and we will do a little comparison of you know lithium ion to those lead acid and nickel batteries uh, in just a minute. Uh, when it comes to a lithium ion battery, though, you really you can break it down into very small building block components. Um, you start at the cell level, and so a lithium ion battery cell is you know the type of thing that you might again find in your phone or your laptop. So you can see sometimes they are cylindrical and they resemble like a double A battery. Um, sometimes they are pouches or uh, like squares, like the ones that are in our battery or in our phones or other uh, consumer electronics. When you wire enough of those cells together, you get what's known as a module, which basically can act as just like, you know, a it's strung together battery. So it's able to hold and then distribute, you know, that much more uh, electricity. Um, and then when you string those modules together, you get what's known as a battery rack. Uh, so again, these are not necessarily new concepts. We've often seen, again, lead acid batteries tied together um, to form a larger, uh, you know, rack of batteries or battery room. Um, but these are highly um, scalable. That's sort of part of why we want to talk about these building blocks is that, you know, you can string together enough modules to be able to provide a battery backup for your home. You can also keep scaling and provide, you know, a grid size asset because you're really using the same building blocks. It's just a, a much larger capacity when you aggregate them all together. Now, comparing lithium ion to some of the other battery energy storage technologies that we see utilized across the industry today, um, there's a few different sort of considerations that we want to look at as to why lithium ion is the lion's share of the market today. Um, round trip efficiency is certainly part of it. So lithium ion batteries are able to charge and discharge extremely efficiently relative to other types of batteries. Um, when it comes to typical duration, they're not the longest lasting battery. And there's a lot of really interesting innovation happening around longer duration energy storage. However, lithium ion comparatively does offer you pretty good energy storage uh, times. Mostly when it comes to like a grid level asset, we usually see them as four hour duration energy storage uh, technologies, which means they're capable of charging and then discharging, you know, up to four hours worth of electricity, depending on the, um, you know, the power needs uh, that that is serving or the, the load that that battery is serving. Um, in terms of time to build, relatively comparable to some of the other technologies, but you really start seeing the benefits of lithium ion when you look at these other things. So in terms of operating costs, once you've built a lithium ion battery and you've commissioned it, they're relatively low price or low cost to maintain. Um, as long as you are, you know, keeping your software up to date, making sure that you're monitoring system health, uh, generally speaking, they're, they're pretty low cost to maintain. And because they're so scalable, they don't require a ton of space. You know, a lead acid battery, you know, they're pretty big. And if you string a bunch of them together, you're, you've really sort of capped out in terms of the amount of capacity you can pack into a small space. But a lithium ion battery is extremely energy dense relative to, to those technologies. Um, cycle life is also another big one. It's towards the more mature end of the market in terms of how long a lithium ion battery is going to last you. Uh, a lot of these really high quality batteries that are used in energy storage systems are expected to have a shelf life and have a manufacturer's warranty over 10 years. Um, the years uh, will really more depend on how you're using the battery, but generally speaking, you can get thousands of, of cycles of charging and discharging from a lithium ion battery. Um, and then finally, the maturity of the technology is that it's commercial. Lithium ion batteries are everywhere. They are, they're literally everywhere. And the future of electrification means we're gonna see them in more and more places, which is really exciting. Um, everything from you know, consumer goods like our leaf blowers and lawn mowers to vehicles to grid backup services. You know, those are all things where we're increase, increasingly, seeing lithium, increasingly seeing lithium ion batteries used. Pardon my, my misspeech. So we talked about energy storage, we've talked about battery energy storage. Now we'll zoom out 
finally and talk about battery energy storage systems and what does that actually mean when we talk about them? Well, it can mean a few different things at a few different size scales. So on the far left is an example of a residential battery energy storage system, which often will be paired with rooftop solar, but not always. Um, a residential battery energy storage system is usually going to be used to service critical load in your house if and when power were to go out, or it can be used uh, as what we call like energy arbitrage or it can help with time of use rates, which means you know, if your utility offers time of use rates where it's you know, cheaper for you to charge up the battery in the evening and you can save on your time of use uh, increased utility rates by discharging the battery to service your, your residential load in the afternoon, well, then that offers you an opportunity to sort of um, you know, decrease your reliance on the grid electricity um, during peak demand and make some money or at least pay off your system uh, you know, more quickly than you might otherwise. Um, and if you are pairing it with residential solar, um, then it's an opportunity to fully, uh, maybe not fully, but you know, almost fully decrease your reliance on the grid for electricity, um, which is great. Uh, can help you can help you uh, pay off that system even quicker. And once that's paid off, you're you're sitting pretty and you can make some money. Um, commercial energy storage systems offer similar benefits to residential, but on a larger scale. So we're still talking about crit uh, serving critical loads on site, which means you know you're serving the example. So this this photo here in the middle is an example of a commercial energy storage facility in Westchester County, which is tied into the energy needs of a business park. And so it's helping the the, the business uh, or the uh, the uh, the asset owner, the real estate owner of that business park, to save money by cutting down on the amount of electricity they're using during peak demand times, um, charging up overnight, dispatching that during the day, and saving on their utility bills in the process. Um, those categories are both what we call behind the meter or customer side installations, which means that they're directly tied to or servicing a, an on-site load. It's not just providing general grid benefits. So you can think of it the same way as a rooftop solar energy system on your home or on your business. It's, it's really tied to your existing energy demand um, on site. On the other hand, you have a utility scale installation, which provides different benefits that we can talk about in just a minute. Um, sometimes it's similar concepts where, you know, at times when the grid is, you know, really tapped out for capacity, you can use a grid scale battery to take energy or electricity off of the, the electric grid and then dispatch it back into the, uh, into the grid when you need that energy. Um, and there's other benefits as well, which we'll, we'll explore in just a minute. But uh, a grid scale battery is usually gonna be referred to as a front of the meter installation or a utility scale or utility side installation. And there's a few different names, but these are some of the ones that you might hear. The other critical component, in addition to cells, modules, and racks that we, we already covered, would be the battery management system. So you can think of, I don't know how many of you guys have an iPhone, but uh, Apple has upgraded uh, you know, their iPhone and other technologies so that they have optimized charging, which means you know, if you plug your, you plug your phone in when you're going to bed at you know, 9, 10 p.m., uh, 8.30, if you're, if you're among the lucky of us, um, when you plug that in, you know, sometimes your phone will give you a message that says it's going to optimize charging and it will finish fully charging by 6 a.m. or something like that. That is a battery management system that's built into your software that can help you control the health of your battery. And most energy storage installations that are being used today have a very similar sophisticated battery management system, which acts as the eyes, ears, and brain of your battery. It's usually able to monitor each cell within the system or at least each module within the system to ensure the health of the system. It will alarm the asset owner if there's any potential issues with that battery. And if required, if there's you know, any type of failure mode within the battery, it will isolate affected cells or modules and trigger any mitigation that needs to happen. So whether that's a sprinkler, if it's a large scale battery, whether that's you know, calling uh, the asset owner or uh, you know, local um, first responders if there's an incident, uh, these, these systems are highly sophisticated and um, are only getting better, which is really the, the great thing here. In terms of land use and local considerations for planning for clean energy, energy storage has some similarities to technologies like wind and solar, but a number of key differences. And I wanna sort of highlight those here as we start to think about how batteries are actually gonna be used and what it means to plan for them as a municipality. 
So like any technology or like any land use, really, there's a few, you know, considerations that are going to absolutely apply to batteries. And that includes, you know, making sure that you're citing these things in an appropriate way relative to your existing zoning. Um, you want to be thinking about environmental impacts as you would under the seeker review process for any installation or any project. Um, you want to be thinking about compliance with your bulk or area standards that are in your zoning law. You want to be thinking about decommissioning city systems so that at the end of systems life, it's not up to you know, the, the landowner necessarily or the town to come in and furnish the costs of decommissioning a system. You want to be making sure that you're thinking about that up front. And then taxation uh, is obviously also a piece of it that we we'll want to be thinking about given, um, much like other clean energy technologies, the tax implications of owning and operating a clean energy system, uh, which includes a battery. Um, however, where it starts to differ is around some of these other things. So like solar and wind, visual and aesthetic impacts are invariably something that municipalities have on their mind when it comes to regulating these projects. Um, for solar, agricultural land impacts often is a big piece of the puzzle too, given that you know solar installation is often going to be looking to go in on relatively flat, cleared land where possible, which in New York State, you know, we're a state that is predominantly forested or agricultural, which means agricultural land is often, you know, a pretty prime place for land-based solar, um, which is why those are land uses that have, you know, really come into contention. And we see the need for mutually beneficial outcomes to preserve agricultural land while also pursuing solar and wind. Um, those things are not as relevant when it comes to preparing for energy storage systems. Really, the, the primary things you want to be thinking about as a municipality for an energy storage installation is going to be the fire safety piece and then incident management training. So we wanna make sure that you know, our first responders know what's going on, that they're kept in the loop about where these, tra uh, these installations are, that they receive training so that if and when they need to, they're able to respond or assist in the event of an emergency with one of these systems. Um, you're really less likely to get the visual aesthetic impacts, although that is still you know, something that will be addressed under seeker and compliance with your zoning. Um, but it's a little bit less of, a, of an issue because we're not talking about, you know, multiple acres of, of batteries for the most part. So applications for battery energy storage systems. Where do these things fit in? Why are we talking about them? What are the various places we see a role for them? So on the left, you can sort of see this very rudimentary uh, depiction, but power generation will be utilized to charge batteries. And it's just a question of what do you want to do with those batteries? So in the case of a residential or commercial battery, you know, going from the left here, maybe you've charged up your battery using renewable generation, whether that's the solar on your roof or whether that's just your local power grid being fed by renewables, you can use it to power your house or you can discharge that energy, you know, right back into the grid when the grid needs it most. Um, perhaps, you know, you can use it to alleviate congestion on the grid where you have you know, I'm no grid engineer, but anyone who's familiar with uh, the power grid knows that it's an extremely delicate thing, despite how much we rely on it. You know, they try and make sure that the amount of generation, the amount of electricity being generated at any given moment is almost or exactly equal to the amount of electricity being consumed at any given moment. And so as we transition to a grid that's more relied up, relying upon wind and solar, batteries offer an opportunity to sort of level out, you know, the amount of production versus consumption and make sure that we're not curtailing or turning off renewables when we're not able to use all the power that's being generated by them. Um, so that's sort of like the high level concept around where and how we're using batteries, but there's a lot of other sort of more niche applications which we can talk about in just a second. Um, I'll sort of lump those, uh, those applications for, battery into a few, for batteries into a few different categories. So the first one would be customer services, which is primarily you know, utility customers that are in the residential or commercial categories. There's also services for the utilities themselves and for the grid itself, which in our case is run by the New York Independent Systems Operator or the New York ISO. Within the customer services, residential and commercial bucket, there's a few different um, benefits to battery energy storage, some of which I've already talked about, some of which are, are maybe uh, new. Actually, I think I might have covered all of these already, but we'll hit them real quick. So again, uh, backup power, depending on how your battery, uh, depending on how your battery is configured, it has the opportunity to potentially provide power, uh, power or backup in the event of a power outage. So it may not, you know, you may not need to rely on a diesel generator or a gas generator to provide your backup services. Um, again, it can help you with increased PV self-consumption. You know, here in New York uh, and and most places, you know, you're 
more likely to be generating the most from your rooftop solar in the middle of the day when people, at least in a pre-COVID world, were usually not working at home. Um, so let me get rid of that. Um, so a lot of utilities offer the ability to uh, distribute excess generation from your rooftop back into the grid and get paid for that. It's called net metering. Um, and this can allow you to you know, utilize the most uh, of your generation by storing it in the battery, and then you can still distribute any excess into the grid uh, under a net metering arrangement. That, I'm listening to Will. I'm sorry, whoever, whoever just joined, if you wouldn't mind just throwing yourself on mute, that would be, that would be great. Glad to have you. Um, the, other, the other sort of more behavioral benefits to uh, having residential or commercial storage have to do again with that sort of time of use filling. Um, basically, utilities are increasingly shifting to, to models whereby during times of peak demand, you know, especially for commercial energy customers, they may be charged a higher rate for usage in that time. And so batteries allow you to sort of stagger your energy profile. Um, in order to avoid paying more for, for electricity during times of peak demand. Um, sometimes it's called time of use bill management. Sometimes it's called demand or peak shaving or load shifting. All of those things mean the same thing. It just refers to your behavioral changes, which allow you to you know, not be charged more for, for power during peak demand. In terms of utility services from energy storage systems, um, there's a couple of key ones. So anyone that knows you know, much about the, the grid of the future when you, when you talk about increased electrification, you know that there is a lot of money that is going to be spent on upgrading the power grid and building new distribution and transmission lines. One of the ways that you can avoid spending more money than you need to on building new power lines is by building energy storage systems. Because part of the reason you need to build new lines is because you're trying to fit more electricity onto your grid than it can take on. You know, I like to think of, uh, if you'll allow me the metaphor, I often think of the power grid similar to how we think of, uh, you have your choice of metaphors. You can think about it in terms of like tributaries of rivers and creeks or you can think about it in terms of the vascular system, in terms of the veins and you know, arteries in our bodies that, that pump blood and circulate blood throughout our bodies. Um, in either case, you know, you'll have these larger, um, what we call like the transmission lines on the grid, which carry more power from over longer distances, the same way our arteries do, or the same way larger rivers do. And then you have distribution lines, which carry um, you know, more localized, uh, they meet more localized energy needs. They don't carry it over as long of a distance and they're smaller, um, much like our veins or smaller creeks and tributaries uh, in terms of you know, moving water around. Um, and in both of those cases, uh, depending on the size of the system, energy storage is you know, an ability, to, it offers you the ability to defer what can be really potentially costly upgrades to your infrastructure. Um, which is which is a really great thing, um, given the energy needs of the future. Um, as I've said, it also helps with transmission congestion relief, meaning you know if you're having a, an issue like California has, where in the middle of the day they're generating more solar than they know what to do with, and then you know in the evening they they don't, don't generate as much renewable energy because their sun's not shining on them. So it can help with that uh, transmission congestion in the middle of the day, um, and then it also helps with resource adequacy, where it makes sure that you have enough electricity when you need it to keep the lights running, which is really the number one concern of any grid operator. Um, the grid services are sort of the same thing, just at a larger level. So now we're going beyond just utility territory. We're not just thinking about, you know, um, National Grid or Orange and Rockland. We're, we're really thinking at the large scale about the grid needs of the entire New York State. And it gives you sort of the same benefits just at a larger scale. I won't spend too much time there. Um, one specific example that is really interesting in New York State is the ability of energy storage to supplant or replace our gas peaker plants. Um, I don't know if you know much about gas peaker plants, but they are rarely used. They sit idle for, you know, maybe 350, if not more, days of the year. And they get paid by, uh, they get paid by the grid operator for what's known as capacity, which means that they're just there to be there for when they're needed. So, you know, maybe that's a couple of days in the middle of the summer when it's the hottest and everyone's running their air conditioner. Um, then the peaker would switch on and it's gonna burn a bunch of gas. It's gonna pollute the area that it's located in. Um, it's gonna spew a bunch of nitrous oxides and sulfur oxides and other contaminants out. Um, it takes a while to turn those plants on because they're sitting there idle for almost all of the year. 
and they're really expensive. Um, and if you replace those with energy storage, you get a lot of the benefits that we just covered for the grid, um, while also you know providing a quicker start time because uh, the batteries are going to be plugged in and ready to charge and discharge electricity. Um, and there's no costs or direct emissions associated with operating you know a larger battery. Um, it's not to say that there's not emissions with the life cycle of you know mining the materials to make a battery, but it's saying upon operation of that battery, you're not going to get any direct emissions from that. So that's sort of the overview of battery energy storage systems. And from there, we'll go to policies, goals, and programs, which are supporting the deployment of clean energy in the state. But I'll take a brief uh, pause here, just as you know, sort of a logical stopping place. And I'm wondering if there's any questions. I see we've got a couple of, uh, looks like we may have a couple of things in the chat. Oh, let me move that there. Yeah, Ian, this is Heather. Um, we just have a couple of comments in the chat. Um, one was just about the benefits of hydroelectric uh, being beyond electricity generation, um, also provides water source for drinking, farming and recreation, and also is uh, non-polluting. Um, Sullivan County is an equal uh, equal opportunity supporter of renewables. Uh, you know, we we think that hydro certainly has its place, um, you know, in, in, in our clean energy future. I mean, Niagara Falls is kind of a cornerstone of, of New York State generation. No doubt. Yeah, and I, I, I couldn't agree more with the comments or in terms of the benefits of, of hydroelectric generation. And if, if anything, I think, you know, one of the supreme benefits that New York has is that we've got hydroelectric assets and they're not threatened in the way that hydroelectric assets in other parts of the country are because of drought and, and other things like that. Um, so I, I think it's a tremendous blessing and hydro will continue to play a very big role as part of you know, New York State's energy profile in the future. I think the challenge really that I'm more trying to highlight is just around the difficulty of citing new hydroelectric generation projects. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, smaller rivers across the state that could be upgraded to, to have hydroelectric assets. And that's sort of a pet project of mine that I'm really hoping we can see even though it's often very expensive. Um, so I'm, I'm curious to see if we're able to make costs fall to, to repower or upgrade existing dams to, to produce electricity. Um, but in terms of building large scale hydroelectric assets, it's, it's really expensive. You have to have the exact right sort of topography or siting to, to be able to do it right. Um, and if you've ever you know, sort of followed the environmental aspects of creating new hydroelectric assets, um, you're usually talking about flooding an area that's not otherwise underwater you're talking about diverting water from one area to another. So citing those projects can often be really challenging. Um, I'll say, as we're about to sort of see when we start talking about the goals, policies, and programs that, you know, New York is really, we're trying to be very pragmatic. And it's, it's really not a question of, you know, picking and choosing what technology. If we have a, a good, clean, renewable asset, we will look to make that part of the future. So, you know, hydroelectric legacy projects are going to be part of the future. Legacy nuclear projects are, you know, counted as part of our, our, our goals here. Um, it's just a, a matter of, you know, the, the difficulty of building new projects for hydroelectric assets is a lot higher uh, than it is for, for some of the other technologies. Excellent. Um, we have just a couple more, one more comment from uh, Mamacating about decommissioning uh, being part of the planning board process for large scale solar projects, um, as well as visual impacts, um, which is wonderful. I will say in Sullivan County, I think that Many, um, I would say the majority of our municipalities have adopted some kind of a solar zoning law, many of them based on the model solar zoning law that was provided um, by NYSERDA. Um, so that was uh, quite successful. And we encourage anyone who hasn't adopted um, one of those uh, zoning laws yet to, to look into it and to do so. And then I do have a couple of questions. One, uh, do all solar farms have battery backup systems for cloudy days, et cetera? Um, and I think that maybe we'll be getting into this. I think that we're probably in Sullivan County talking about distributed um, uh, solar um, and whether or not they have battery backup systems. Um, and the other question is just about solar and batteries in general. Do they provide um, enough energy storage to make them worth it? There are concerns about long-term decommissioning. Are you going to address this tonight? Couple of, couple of great questions. Um, I'll say that I, I, I won't get into solar project decommissioning in, in detail. Um, you know, we, we, we do touch on that in some of our other presentations, but I'm happy to bring that up if we've got some time at the end. Um, for battery energy storage system decommissioning, we can talk about it a little bit as well. Pardon me. Um, the nice thing with battery decommissioning is that even if you don't adopt a solar zoning or a, a battery zoning law in your local law, the uh, uniform code requires decommissioning plans for battery storage systems, which are 
uh, created in compliance with um, you know third party verification for larger battery systems. So decommissioning is going to be built in for any battery system that's installed in compliance with the uniform code, which is applicable in all of your towns without the need for local adoption. So your bases will be covered on decommissioning, but we will talk a little bit more a little bit more about what that looks like later. Um, the other question was um, whether all I think it was like whether all solar projects have batteries. Was that right? You know, that's correct. I think that was a question. So I'd say I wouldn't say yes. Uh, not every project does at this point. I think it's becoming increasingly popular to to pair distributed solar projects with uh, a battery facility. Um, for you know, again, reasons that I think are, are relatively common across the sort of buckets of, of applications we talked about earlier. But you know, for instance, like a a distributed energy resources project, like a community solar project or even a smaller project, when you are under a net metering agreement or are, are under a VEDER agreement, which is you know the way that community solar projects get compensated, um, they are paid a higher you know dollar per kilowatt hour uh, rate for the amount of electricity that they generate. And so, if they're able to use the the battery system to you know charge up that battery during times when they wouldn't be getting paid as much and then uh, discharge that battery back into the grid later in the day during peak demand. Um, that really helps the economics of a solar and storage project. And for that reason, we've seen an increasing number of community solar projects paired with the battery storage um, as part of it. Um, I would not say every project does that though. Um, sometimes the developer just doesn't work with batteries. Sometimes they can't pencil out the cost. Um, I'd say there's a lot of variability, but I'd say it's increasingly common to see them paired um, at, at all at all sizes of installations. All right. Um, I have one more question that just came in, and I think that we can move on. Um, are nickel cadmium batteries still in use, or are they an outdated technology? Great question. Um, nickel cad is definitely still in use, but I would say it's not demanding as much attention as as lithium ion, um, especially because of some some of the more recent innovations in terms of lithium ion batteries. Um, looking at different like iron phosphates and, and other types of batteries, I would say that those, um, because of their their advances in efficiency and the amount of discharges you can get from the life cycle of the battery, I think that those have been sort of made to be the compelling uh, technology currently for energy storage systems. So I don't think nickel cad is, is going anywhere the same way I don't think lead acid or flow batteries are fully going anywhere, but they're definitely not going to be the, the lion's share of the market the way we're seeing with uh, lithium ion. So with that, why don't we keep chugging along here? Uh, talk briefly about the goals, policies, and programs, which I think that my colleague may have covered during the comprehensive plan um, training. So I don't need to spend too much time here. Um, but you can't really talk about climate goals or technologies in New York State without talking about the CLCPA, the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, also called the Climate Act. Uh, it was passed in 2019 and it codified a few ambitious targets for uh, New York clean energy and decarbonization goals. Uh, the first one is that we're trying to hit 70% renewable electricity by 2030 and 100% emissions-free power grid by 2040. And to support those goals, there are some technology-specific goals that we are you know, looking to, to meet. And we've already seen these goals uh, be increased based on the progress that we've made to date. So initially, we were supposed to get 6,000 megawatts or 6 gigawatts of distributed solar by 2025, but community solar has been a really successful market in New York State. So that goal has been increased by the governor up to 10,000 megawatts or 10 gigawatts of distributed solar by 2025. Uh, we're also looking to meet 9,000 megawatts or nine gigawatts of offshore wind by 2035, as well as energy storage targets, which were increased as well. So I believe the new figures are 6,000 megawatts by 2030 instead of three. So we've effectively doubled our energy storage capacity goals. Um, the reason I think it's really important to talk about this is that I think it's often, you know, that our communities, um, for very understandable reasons, feel inundated by, you know, a single type of project, and it makes it seem like the state is pinning all of its hopes and dreams on, you know, one technology, and the truth couldn't be further from that. Um, you know, we very much have an approach where we're looking at any and all solutions uh, to see how they can play into our clean energy future. Um, and that means offshore winds, that means onshore winds, it means rooftop solar to large scale solar, residential batteries to large commercial batteries, you know, all of those technologies are on the table. Hydrogen is something that we're looking at, as I've mentioned, um, you know, all of these assets are on the table as we look to sort of figure out what it means for New York to reach these ambitious goals. 
Um, part of that is the solicitations for large scale renewables that NYSERDA puts out on an annual basis. Um, every year, NYSERDA will release these RFPs, requests for proposals, whereby developers will you know, propose a large scale project that they have in development. Primarily, those are solar and wind projects. Um, occasionally, you'll see a small hydroelectric facility repowering. Like I said earlier, I, I love those projects, but they're, they're pretty hard to pencil out in terms of project economics, so you don't see too many of those. Um, but increasingly, we are seeing these projects paired with large-scale battery storage installations as well, and they provide some of the benefits that we've talked about earlier. Um, oftentimes, those battery projects are paired with large-scale solar. Um, sometimes it's with wind as well, but generally speaking, we've seen them paired with solar. Um, and the solicitation, uh, solicitation awards from last year are still pending, but this is a, a map showing you where all the existing large-scale projects that have been awarded under a nice sort of solicitation are, are located in the state. Um, I will note that I do not work on the large-scale renewables team. I work with them, so I don't have all of the answers to large-scale questions, but I will do my best if anyone has questions. I'm happy to put you in touch with the right people if, uh, if you have you know, more detailed questions about our solicitations. We also have an energy storage program. Um, so, you know, if you know anything about NYSERDA, uh, we are not a regulatory body, but we do provide incentives for everything from, you know, rooftop residential solar up to large scale solar, like we just talked about there. And we have energy storage built in as a program that we are providing incentives for as well. Um, most of those incentives are currently dry. Uh, we've exhausted most of our funding for battery energy storage system incentives, but I anticipate we will be adding new blocks of funding to the program in the near future. Um, and for a snapshot of energy storage deployment across the state, you can look at this map here. I apologize if it's really small, but again, we'll, we'll share. I saw at least one person move towards the screen, so I, I know it's, it's small and hard to see, um, but I'll make sure that this is in the slides and you'll be able to, to take a better look. Um, as of last year, and we're currently awaiting the updated energy storage roadmap filing, which NYSERDA sort of files on an annual basis. Um, so we're waiting for updated numbers from that. But as of last year, we'd already seen 115 megawatts of battery storage installed around the state, which comprised over a thousand projects. Um, as of now, or uh, earlier this year, we've got over a thousand megawatts of energy storage, which is contracted and in the development pipeline. So that means that they've already applied to their utilities for an interconnection agreement. Now, not all of those projects are going to come to fruition, but you can see that we are, you know, have a really strong start to meeting our targets by 2025 and 2030. Um, and that 1200 megawatts in the pipeline includes over 100 large-scale commercial and bulk energy storage projects, which means they're, they're large and they're doing you know, some of those really key important grid services that we talked about earlier, including saving us the need to spend literally billions of dollars on building new transmission and distribution lines. So there's a lot of benefits for, for everyone, including the folks that want to see responsible you know, government money spent, you know, energy storage systems, while they are also expensive, um, you know, they offer a pair to uh, what is really challenging to, to build um, new, you know, distribution and transmission lines. So that's sort of a, the, the quick introduction to, you know, the policies and programs that are supporting energy storage across the state in New York. Um, from here, again, we're going to spend the bulk of our time here talking about the model law. Um, so you, you can sort of understand here why the state is looking for, you know, new, you um, looking to install battery energy storage systems. And if you've talked about solar, or if you're familiar with solar, then you know that the way that solar projects get permitted depends on the size of the project, right? So in New York State, generating facilities like wind and solar, um, once they reach a certain size, they are permitted by the state. Um, they go through a state level permitting process. Historically, that was called Article 10. Uh, since 2020, that's been uh, under the, the domain of a new state energy office called the Office of Renewable Energy Siting, which is independent of NYSERDA. They are more of a regulatory body where they're actually permitting projects. Um, so projects over a certain size, that's 25 megawatts, they are permitted at the state level. Um, there's still a role whereby the local government and the community is involved in the process, but ultimately the permitting decision rests with the state for those large projects. For smaller projects, they're permitted in accordance with anything that you have in your zoning law. That means if you've adopted a solar law, they'd be permitted in accordance with that. 
if you don't have a solar law, they'd be permitted in accordance with, you know, the special use permit site plan review process that you have in your law. Batteries are a little bit different. So the state level siting office, which applies to all renewable generating projects like wind and solar over 25 megawatts, does not have independent authority over battery energy storage technologies, which means that any battery system, if it's not paired with a renewable generating facility, let's say it's 100 megawatts of battery energy storage. It's large enough that if it were a solar project, it would be permitted by the state. If it's not paired with solar, it's gonna be permitted by the local government. If it is paired with solar, then it will be permitted by the state through the existing process. But because of that, I think it's really important that communities consider adopting or at least thinking about adopting regulations to, to zone and permit energy storage facilities in their community. Because again, theoretically, you know, it's something that can help you regulate everything from residential batteries, which are really good for your community and your code enforcement official to know where in the community those systems are being installed and that they're being installed safely. Everything from those residential systems up to a large scale battery facility is something that could be under the permitting review of your municipality. I know that that seems potentially stressful, but there's good news. And that good news is that there are resources that are available from NYSERDA and there is coverage in the uniform code, which ensures that you are covered in many aspects um, in terms of safe installation of these systems, whether or not you adopt a zoning law. However, as you know, all of the planners in the room know, um, you know, a zoning law and the uniform building code and fire code, they don't always serve the same purposes, right? Like zoning has its own, its own purposes. And so I think it's worth considering how you want to protect yourself against battery energy storage installations. That's phrased wrongly. How you want to prepare for battery energy storage installations in the future. It's not about protecting from, it's about, you know, planning responsibly for, for these systems. So the battery guidebook, the battery storage guidebook for local governments contains four chapters. We have our model zoning law, we have a model permit and an inspection checklist, and we have a collection of code citations relevant to energy storage, which is aimed to help our municipal officials with understanding you know, all the regulations that are in place for batteries. If anyone is familiar with the uniform solar permit, or I'm sorry, the unified solar permit, um, that was something that was created a few years ago as a way of helping streamline um, local like residential solar installations. And the model permit and inspection checklist are meant to do the same thing for residential battery systems. So the idea here is that installing a battery energy storage system in the house, relatively speaking, it's a similar process house after house after house. You don't necessarily need all of the detailed site plan review requirements that you would need for a larger solar or battery system. And so the model permit and inspection checklist provides your code enforcement officials with a streamlined process while still making sure that they're checking all of the code compliances that they need to to make sure that your systems are being installed correctly, which is the number one thing you can do to ensure that you're not going to have fire risks from the battery. It means you're installing it in you know, accordance with New York State's extremely up to date code. Um, at the time we adopted our battery code. We were the only state in the country, and I think we are still tied with all, you know, with California basically as having the most uh, advanced battery code in the, in the country. It was adopted based on the 2021 International Fire Code cycle back in 2019, um, which means it's still, you know, as relevant today as it was a couple of years ago, if not, you know, more. Um, I guess I talked about this earlier, but again, the permitting process will vary based on whether or not your battery system is paired with a generator. So if it is paired with a generator, but it's uh, less than 25 megawatts, like a community solar project, it's going to be permitted at the local level using your law and seeker. If it's paired with a renewable generator that's higher than 25 megawatts in terms of capacity, it's going to be permitted by the state. And then if it's a standalone system, if it's just a battery, there's no solar associated with it, it's going to be permitted at the local level regardless of the size of the project, which means you want to be thinking about adopting regulations that cover your bases in terms of all size of projects. So the contents of the law, relatively straightforward, um, similar to our solar law that's sort of got the, the nuts and bolts that you need to have in your zoning law in terms of the authority for adopting the law, the statement of purpose, all of that stuff. You'll note that we, much like with our solar law, we, we've broken our you know, categories of battery sizes into a couple of different tiers. Um, our battery law currently only has two tiers, which is designed in compliance with um, or to align with what's in the uniform code. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. 
There's also sections pertaining to safety, the permit time frame, enforceability, severability, and those things. So a lot of it, you know, we don't spend too much time on because it's relatively boilerplate stuff, but we really want to talk about the permitting requirements, um, you know, across those different tiers of batteries. Uh, authority, really straightforward. Again, you're going to reference the appropriate citation for municipal law um, that enables your municipality to adopt, you know, regulations for the community. Nothing new there. Uh, jumping ahead to definitions. Um, definitions is where we, you have an opportunity to define it by size. Now, you could choose to say, you know, residential battery is its own tier and, you know, other, other places like that. We've chosen to draw the line in the following places. Um, for us, tier one energy storage systems are going to be those that are less than or equal to 600 kilowatt hours. Um, and consist of a single battery technology. Meaning if you're mixing lithium ion batteries and lead acid batteries, you're not tier one, regardless of the size of your project because multiple technologies means different risks and different profiles associated with those systems, which means it requires a more complex review. But if it's one technology and it's less than 600 kWh, for us, that's a tier one system. And I know that that can seem really big and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about you know, why, why that's okay. Um, but totally understand if that sort of initially feels like a pretty big number. Um, tier two is going to be the opposite. So anything that's larger than 600 kWh is going to be treated as a tier two system or any systems comprising multiple battery technologies in the same room or enclosed area. Um, and that 600 kWh distinction, as I've mentioned earlier, it is pulled straight from the uniform code. Um, the uniform code for any systems that are larger than 600 kWh, it requires a few different uh, much more stringent uh, requirements in terms of documentation and testing that those projects have to go through. And so for that reason, we've chosen to draw our lines uh, between the tiers to align with what's in the uniform code because it makes it easier for the code enforcement official and who doesn't like aligning with best practices from the code committees that work on this stuff 24-7, 365. Um, I like to listen to the experts where, where and when I can. Um, so some examples then of projects that would fit under that tier one size. Um, you can see on the left is an example of an LG Chem home battery system, which is going to be, you know, this is like a simulated image, but it would be hooked up to a rooftop solar array and it would be providing backup power for the residents where it's installed. Um, these middle examples are larger though, right? Like this is a lead acid battery room, which is under 600 kWh and it would technically be treated as a tier one installation. As with these battery cabinets, as with, again, this example of an LG Chem residential battery, you can see it on the outside wall of someone's house here. So those would be examples of tier one batteries. Tier two are your larger installations. So that ranges from, you know, the one on the left, which this is a Lockheed Martin energy storage system. It's large enough that it would be serving the uses for, or serving the onsite load for like a commercial enterprise, like a business park, or, you know, maybe just a standalone large business, like a box, a big box store or something like that. And then these other sizes of installations, which are examples of large scale grid installations that would be providing, you know, grid benefits or would be paired with a large scale solar or wind project. And you'll forgive me, normally I have more photos of New York examples, but I seem to be missing that slide here. So if you can envision batteries just like these ones, but in the, the bucolic hills of, of New York, uh, that's what you would see here. So. Um, yeah, so in terms of permitting requirements, again, tier one being the smaller systems, we think that there is cause for a more streamlined permitting process. Um, it's not to say you're skimping on the requirements at all. It's just to say that they don't require the same require the same level of stringent review as a tier two does. So for tier one, we would recommend using the battery energy storage uh, unified permit, basically that we've got created here. Uh, you'd also have your code enforcement official use the inspection checklist provided in this guidebook, and then any and all relevant applicable fire code requirements um, that is applicable to the project. So once you get into the fire code, you can initially see that you know. Under the zoning law, it's technically treating a residential system under the same process as it would a commercial system. However, when it goes to actually apply the codes to that project, you know, when your code enforcement official is sitting down and reviewing project plans for compliance, they wouldn't be treating these projects the same at all because the residential system would be subject to the residential fire code or the residential code rather, which has its own rules and regulations around battery storage facilities. And then if it's a commercial project, 
regardless of if it's being, you know, using a streamlined permitting process, it would be applicable with the uh, New York State Fire Code, which has more stringent requirements than the residential code. So even though, you know, this could be anything from 20 kWh to 600 kWh, which is a pretty big range in tier one, there's a lot of differences in terms of how they're actually going to be permitted by your code enforcement official based on what's applicable in the fire code. For tier two, those are your larger facilities, which are going to be commercial and grid scale projects. You're going to have a much more stringent review process, just like you would for a large scale solar projects. So we generally recommend using a special use permit process, full site plan review with your planning board, and then again, the application of any applicable citations from the fire code, of which there are many for large scale projects. So starting with tier one, um, you, this is uh, you know, screenshots of the model permit, which again is available as part of the guidebook. It looks a lot like the unified solar permit. Gives you an opportunity to enter you know, a permitting fee schedule in accordance with the requirements for your code enforcement official to review these projects fully. And you wanna just customize that. Again, all of this is highly customizable based on municipal uh, priorities and preferences. Um, the model permit allows the applicant to fulfill you know, all the information that they need to, to describe the project to its full extent. So is it a residential or commercial use? What is the nameplate capacity in terms of KWH? Uh, what is the power rating in terms of the amount of power it can give off or take on at any given moment? That can be in either AC or DC. They're gonna indicate how they're coupling the system, if it's AC or DC coupled, or if it's a standalone energy storage system. You wanna have them indicate the chemistry of the battery. So if it's a lithium ion battery or a different chemistry, the reason you do that is because the fire code has different requirements based on the chemistry of the battery. Again, we adopted a, a really thorough battery code to make sure that the safety requirements that are gonna be in place will be there and are customized to the type of battery that it is. You're not gonna treat a lead acid battery with the same you know, fire safety precautions that you will a lithium ion battery because they have different risks. So you wanna make sure you're getting that information from the proposer upfront. And then you're also gonna to wanna to get the installation type and location. Is it indoor, is it outdoor? Is it in an attached garage? Is it on a rooftop? The reason you wanna get all of that is because again, the code has different requirements based on the type and location of the installation. Um, from there, the permit describes the submittal requirements that an applicant has to include um, if they're trying to apply for a battery. So that means they're gonna provide all the site plan documentation, for all the plan documentation, rather, uh, construction documents, it's all gonna be stamped or signed by a uh, registered architect or a New York State engineer, um, and some other details. But really, you're gonna just make sure that you're getting all the necessary material up front. Um, and that's all on tier one. I mean, it's a relatively straightforward process because again, your code enforcement official is gonna be reviewing these plans in detail. They're gonna be checking everything in compliance with either the residential code or the fire code based on the type of installation. Um, I will note that we also have training specifically geared towards code enforcement officials and fire officials um, to walk them through the uniform code and all the different um, requirements that we have in place for battery storage facilities. So we'll talk about some of that a little bit later in this presentation, but just wanna throw the flag out there that for our code enforcement officials in the room, uh, you're not being asked to go through this alone. The state has resources and training is available to make sure that you are well aware with the permitting requirements um, for these different systems, everything from residential to large scale projects. But we really wanna talk about tier two because tier two, those larger battery installations, you know, you really wanna be making sure that you're permitting and reviewing those applications with a fine tooth comb. And so much like you might for large scale solar, for a tier two energy storage facility, you wanna be thinking about what zoning districts you wanna permit those systems in, right? Uh, a tier two battery, that's a really large facility. It's serving you know, a non-residential or grid scale load. So it wouldn't make sense to make those a permissible use or permissible use in you know, our high density residential areas. Um, so you really gotta think about zoning district compliance and where you wanna see those projects go. Um, I'll say, just like with solar, and I, I think that this is something that was covered in the comprehensive plan workshop, if you're able to join there. Um, one of the things that you want to be thinking about when it comes to where you want to make these an allowable use is the grid infrastructure that's in place in your community. Um, you don't want to make batteries only an applicable use or an acceptable use in zoning districts that don't have 
grid infrastructure. You know, these projects want to be built near substations. They want to be built right alongside the power grid. So it's really important to be thinking strategically about where you want to make these in allowable use because I just think it, it just doesn't make sense if you're only going to make them an allowable use in a place where they're never going to happen because it's not feasible. So if you have any questions about that in terms of hosting capacity mapping or visualizing grid infrastructure, please reach out to our team. We're happy to help you and your town do that as you look to develop a law. Um, you also want to document the process for applying for and receiving a permit for a tier two system in this section. So you wanna make sure that applications will be reviewed for completeness within a certain time frame. This says 10 business days. I would recommend, especially until you have your sort of your feet under you in terms of reviewing an application for a battery system, you probably wanna do more than 10 days. Um, you know, I think every industry player would want, you know, one day if they could get it from you. But I think a couple of weeks, a month is, is relatively fine, depending on the size of the project that you're talking about, um, especially until you're more familiar with the technologies. Um, anything beyond that, I'd say you're, you're probably getting you know, a little bit a little bit more in the, the longer time frame, especially considering that there's provisions that require peer review that will be provided by the applicant for projects that are larger than 600 kilowatt hours. Um, but you want to make sure you're leaving enough time to make sure that you can review these projects fully. Um, like anything, again, for a site plan review, it's going to have a public hearing process. So you want to make sure that you're documenting the process that's applicable or referencing the existing um, site plan and or a special use permit public hearing requirements that you have in place in your community. Uh, you also want to make reference to um, any review necessary by a county planning department, if that is you know, uh, applicable and um, any uh, any timeline around the decision making for a final approval or denial of a permit. Now, in terms of requirements for approval and documentation that an applicant needs to be providing to the town up front, there's a few things much like a solar project that you're going to want to see documented on the site plan. Uh, plans for utility lines and circuits, uh, signage, any lighting that's necessary at the facility, um, fencing should be there. I'm, I'm not sure if that comes up later, but fencing should be there. Uh, vegetation and tree cutting, noise, decommissioning, site plan requirements, special use permit standards, ownership changes. You know, those are all sections that I think we'll talk a little bit about in just a minute. Um, at least some of the important ones we'll talk about in just a minute, but those are all sections uh, or considerations that are addressed in our model law for these larger systems. We had the question earlier about decommissioning. Um, so our model law does have a section that covers decommissioning, which we would highly recommend everyone consider implementing in their own law. Um, and there is also decommissioning that's referenced in the fire code. Now, within our decommissioning plan, what we would recommend you require an applicant to provide upfront would be, what is the anticipated life of the system, including potentially what is the warranty being issued by the equipment manufacturer for replacement of these systems? what is the estimated decommissioning cost to remove the project and um, um, remediate the, uh, the site where the project is located? How did you come to that cost estimate? Don't take anyone that is giving you a cost estimate for their word and make them show you the math, make them provide you know, an, uh, a third party engineer if anything about their numbers seems weird. Make sure that you are understanding how they arrived at the cost that they have for the estimated decommissioning price. Um, you want to understand how they're going to make sure that there is funding available to decommission the project upon the event of something happening to the facility or at the end of the facility's useful life. If they decide they're not going to repower it with new components, who is going to pay for that decommissioning and how are they going to pay for it? You want to make sure it's not the town that is left holding that. Um, you also want to make sure there's a method to keep the decommissioning cost current with current project prices. So whether that means a couple of things, sometimes it means an escalator, meaning, you know, let's say, we think it's going to cost $100,000, um, you know, to, to decommission this project. But as a contingency, every year we will add 2% to that cost. So, you know, year one is 100% of the decommissioning cost. Year two, it's 102%. And that accounts for inflation. It accounts for changing project costs, things like that. Um, more recently, we've seen communities and developers find a mutually agreeable approach, which says that they'll revisit the cost every five years or so, and then update the letter of credit or the bond from there. Um, that can just make it easier because you don't have to go in on an annual basis. Um, it also can help because we've seen inflation and project costs change substantially year over year 
sometimes going up, sometimes costs going down. Um, it really just depends. And so a five-year timeline can sort of smooth out the changes that might otherwise be applicable year over year in terms of changing inflation and costs. Um, and then finally, you want to have a step-by-step -step of what it actually means for the project to be decommissioning, to be decommissioned and for the site to be restored. Um, so you want to play by play from the applicant of what it's going to mean for them to decommission their project. What are the staffing needs to make sure that that happens? What are all the processes? Where is you know, where are all these batteries being carted off to once they're removed from the site? Is anything able to be recycled? Is it going to have to be landfilled? You know, you want to be knowing that ahead of time. Um, on the recycling front, battery recycling is tremendously promising and New York actually has and is going to have the largest lithium ion battery recycling facility in the country. Um, with that said, it's still in its infancy because a lot of the lithium ion batteries in circulation today have a multi-year lifespan. And so until there's a stream of batteries that need to be recycled, it's hard to make the economics work for building a recycling infrastructure. However, we're doing it and we're really excited about it. It's a company called Lifecycle, which is up in the Rochester area, which is building the largest lithium ion battery plant, uh, recycling plant in uh, North America. Um, the decommissioning fund on the right, again, so you want to make sure the applicant is continuously maintaining a, a fund to cover the cost of decommissioning, um, whether that be a bond, a letter of credit. I would say that those are the most common decommissioning um, securities that we've seen used across the state. Sometimes people like to do um, you know, to try and ask for like an escrow account to be paid in cash. I would say that an escrow account can make a lot of sense for like project review costs. But for decommissioning a letter of credit in the bonds is, you know, every bit as good in terms of providing the town with the assurance that that money will be available from the developer upon decommissioning without overburdening the developer with additional upfront costs. Um, you know, these projects are already really expensive and they're spending a lot of money on the hardware up front. So adding costs up front really just make it harder for the economics of these projects to pencil out. Pencil out. Um, whereas a bond and a letter of credit provide the same assurance to the town. So I would encourage the municipality to, you know, talk to their um, local attorney, try and get an understanding of the pros and cons of these different models and, you know, be able to discuss with developers when they're proposing these projects, what is a mutually agreeable and mutually beneficial type of decommissioning surety. Um, yeah. So that's uh, that's decommissioning. It's incredibly important for batteries, just as it is for solar. I'm glad that you guys, uh, you know, all of your municipalities in the county are, are taking a, a good, serious look at including decommissioning for solar in your laws, if you haven't already, and would recommend that you do the same for batteries. Um, continuing tier two permitting requirements, um, site plan application is a really important part. And this is, again, where you're wanting to make sure that you have all of the key information that should be provided to the municipality upfront upon their application. And a lot of this looks pretty similar to what you're going to see for any type of project that's going through a site plan proposal. Um, you know, property lines and physical features, any landscaping changes that have to happen to accommodate the system. So if that means any grading or other large, you know, landscaping um, uh, techniques that have to be implemented, you want to make sure that you know what's going to be going on at that site ahead of time. Uh, you definitely need electrical diagrams. These are incredibly complex systems that are going to need engineering review. Um, again, a lot of that's provided as a peer review by the developer as required by the fire code. Um, but you want to make sure that you're getting that all of that up front, including spec sheets for the equipment that's actually being utilized by the developer. A lot of the times when they're proposing a project, they'll have an idea of what the components they're going to use are. But by the time they're permitting or going through the permitting process, you want to make sure that you have the most up to date spec sheets um, for for the equipment that's being used on site. Uh, and the reason that you want that is because, you know, the um, characteristics of the technology and the battery management systems and all of the, those components can vary from manufacturer to manufacturer or even from year to year within the same manufacturer. So you want to make sure that you have the exact knowledge of what systems are being put in place. You want contact info for the system owner and operator, um, and you want contact info for um, uh, sorry, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm both the owner and the operator. So who's actually going to be on site or in proximity monitoring the system 24-7? And then who are the asset owners? You want both of those pieces of information. Um, 
commissioning plan, which is different than the decommissioning plan. So whereas the decommissioning plan walks you through the process of taking this thing apart and uh, you know ameliorating the site, the commissioning plan does the opposite, right? It tells you exactly what the process will be to get the system up and running. You know, what are the processes? What are the tests that need to be run? All of those things. You wanna make sure that they're giving you that idea up front. A fire safety compliance plan and an emergency operations plan, so numbers nine and 13, those are both incredibly important. And those are things that are already required under the uniform code, but we think it's pretty important to make sure that you're also reiterating those up front in your zoning law because of how important they are to the safe installation of battery energy storage facilities. So a fire safety compliance plan is gonna give you a clear understanding that this project is being install, installed up to snuff with the um, fire prevention and mitigation requirements that are included in the uniform code. Um, and that's gonna be something that gives your, your code enforcement official and their peer review an opportunity to step-by-step -step walk through the code requirements and see if and how this project is in compliance. Um, an emergency ops plan, it tells you what's going to happen if something were to go wrong. You know, what are the protocols that are in place? Who is responsible for responding to the incident? And what are the steps that are involved in monitoring and making sure that that system, you know, is um, uh, that, that uh, safety is ensured, that, you know, everything is going up to code in terms of how we're responding to an incident. Um, some of the things I skipped over are relatively standard site plan um, requirements, like an, op an operation and maintenance plan, an O&M plan. So how is the facility owner and operator going to be maintaining the site? Are they mowing? How often do they need to do, you know, lawn or not lawn maintenance, but land maintenance on site, things like that. And then other engineering documents that you're going to want to make sure everything is signed and stamped by, a, again, a professional engineer or a registered architect. Now, the fire safety compliance plan and the emergency ops plan are bolded here, again, not only because they're important, but because they're the primary consideration when it comes to like a land use or a local impact that a local government should be thinking about. You know, again, these systems are not going to be taking up, you know, 50 or 100 acres the way a community or a large scale solar project might. But they are going to be, you know, a really unique project that has the potential, if not installed correctly, if not installed in compliance with the code, to cause an issue. You know, I think we've probably all heard stories about like the uh, Samsung phones that were, you know, uh, you weren't able to fly with them a couple of years ago because of the, the predisposition to causing battery fires. We've also seen some really shoddy batteries that are used in like electric scooters have caused issues. Um, those are not the same types of batteries that are used in these battery energy storage uh, systems. Uh, these are much higher quality batteries from esteemed manufacturers. However, fire safety is still very important when you're talking about the energy density that you get with a technology like lithium ion batteries. So for that reason, we're going to spend a few minutes talking about the fire safety requirements that are in place for these systems and sort of how we got to where we are today. Um, to sort of give you an idea of the coverage that, again, is already in place, even if you do not adopt a battery energy storage system law in your zoning law. So codes and standards are king in terms of fire safety requirements. Um, back in 2016, the Underwriter, Underwriters Laboratory, or UL, which is a prominent code writing organization, they published the first edition of UL 9540, which is a standard for lithium ion batteries um, that gives you an indication of their, their safety um, in terms of how well they're manufactured and put together. And that's something that the equipment manufacturers themselves have to get certified and tested to, um, to, to meet the 9540 standard. Um, in 2017, a year later, UL published 9540A, which is not a standard, but rather a test method to ensure um, that these facilities are, or that these uh, energy storage systems are able to meet the fire safety requirements that they have to. And speaking candidly, the way that you do a 9540A test is you light the thing on fire and you see what happens. You see if the fire safety rating of the system holds, does it contain the fire as long as it's supposed to? If there's a sprinkler or a fire mitigation you know, component built into the system, is that system able to contain the fire or able to put the fire out the way it's supposed to? And if it is, it completes its 9540A listing. You get that, the equipment manufacturer can come to your town and say, look, I did my 9540A testing. It demonstrated that if something were to happen, you know, worst case scenario, if this battery were to catch on fire, 
that the system it's rated, the, the fire safety rating that it's rated at is sufficient. It's not gonna keep burning. If we respond to it correctly, it's not gonna pose any more of a risk than it inherently does uh, with the standards that are in place. Um, 9540A is awesome. It is a really great requirement. And again, to my knowledge, we were the first in the country to require this. And I think that California is, is now in the code, same code cycle that we are. Um, I'm not sure if other states are as well, but we are really at the forefront there. Um, excuse me, in 2018, the ICC, the International Code Council, first introduced an energy storage systems chapter into their law, or into their code rather, and then in 2019, the National Fire Protection Association, or NFPA, introduced NFPA 855, um, UL and the ICC continued to introduce updated fire codes as well. And so our code, the, the New York State Uniform Fire Prevention and Building Code, pulls from all of these. Um, it's the 2021 International Fire Code cycle as done by the ICC. We have requirements that mirror those for 9540A and then FPA 55. All of these codes are in place in some way, shape, or form throughout our uniform code, um, which is great. So, I mean, really, there is a, a very significant amount of protection that is in place for municipalities, um, even without the need for local adoption. So why are we talking about fire safety with lithium ion batteries? What does that mean? Why do we need to be thinking about it? The main concept is what is known as thermal runaway. And what is thermal runaway? Thermal runaway is what happens when something goes wrong within a battery, uh, battery system. And that uh, something going wrong means it usually overheats. And as that heat builds and builds and builds, it propagates from one part of the battery to another. And eventually it can lead to a really, a really bad situation where the whole thing is overheating and has the potential to catch on fire. So what happens with thermal runaway? Um, generally, it starts with what's called battery abuse. So that can mean a few different things. It can mean thermal abuse, meaning again, it's overheating and it, it reaches the, the point where, you know, that po poses a, a catastrophic impact to the system. It can also be physical abuse, meaning, you know, maybe the battery gets punctured. You know, if you've ever seen um, like generally speaking with the, on the electric vehicle, you know, if they're in an accident and that battery gets punctured, that's often why, you know, something can go wrong with a, with a, a larger battery system. And so that's just the type of battery abuse. So whether it's physical abuse, whether it's, you know, thermal or, or some other type of, you know, poor treatment of the battery that can trigger thermal runaway. Um, what happens as that system heats up, it starts off gassing, it can start venting. So if something were to go wrong, the chemicals in that battery um, can start producing, you know, gases that can potentially be flammable. Um, the rise in internal temperature can, um, you know, start off gassing. It's still preventable at this stage, even if it starts off gassing. Um, from there, once it starts going to thermal runaway, it can start producing smoke. Um, by that point, you really are in a bad situation and you need to contain the thermal runaway before it propagates even further in the system. Potentially from there, once there's smoke, there can be fire. So thermal runaway is underway once you're seeing fire from a battery and you have to contain it um, through some means of propagation, whether that's water or whether that is you know, a clean agent or another type of mitigation technology. And then from there, if it's not contained, again, it can continue to propagate to other cells and other modules throughout. So what does that actually look like in practice? For example, again, I mentioned when they do the 9548 testing, they're literally, they're trying to set this project or the system on fire to see how it will respond. So what that might look like is they may pierce or overheat. Generally, they do it by overheating uh, a single cell within the battery. And as that cell heats up and heats up and heats up and heats up, it's gonna warm up the cells around it, right? And as those heat up and heat up, it's gonna affect the cells around those. And so generally speaking, you know, once you have uh, thermal one away start in one cell, it can propagate to those around it. And that can mean that you have full modules or whole racks within a battery system that can start going into thermal runaway. Um, doesn't mean that you can't do anything about it. So water, clean agents, there are other, you know, technologies you can put in place to, uh, to help um, alleviate uh, thermal runaway as it's happening. Um, and you can sort of see some of the different things that you can do to stop thermal runaway um, throughout the process here. So you're still in the preventative region, region as you're getting that battery abuse and starting to off gas. And so some of the things that can be done to make sure that you're minimizing your risks for fire safety include the following, making sure that you're using high quality components. So again, cell quality matters. These energy storage facilities, these energy storage systems are from reputable manufacturers. These are not the same people that are manufacturing batteries that go into 
your nephew's uh, you know, hoverboard. These are much higher quality batteries, but you wanna make sure that you're making sure that, uh, sorry, you wanna make sure that you're requiring applicants that are looking to build a project in your town to be using a reputable manufacturer. And that's why it's important to get those spec sheets up front when they're applying for a project permit in your town. Um, system controls and the battery management system are probably, you know, maybe number two, second only to code compliance in terms of preventing thermal runaway. The battery management system is monitoring system health down to the cell level usually, and they can trigger, you know, system shutdown or isolation within the system um, as soon as they see something start to go wrong with any component in your system. Um, off-gas detection and fire detection will become important, um, but particularly off-gas detection for like a system that's located in, you know, indoors, if it's not an outdoor system, you want to make sure that there is a gas monitor to check if there's any, um, you know, gas that's being produced. Um, so like lead acid batteries, you know, we're, we're probably all familiar with lead acid batteries. It's the type that's in your car. You know, they have these little battery caps because they lead acid batteries as you're using them actually give off toxic gases as part of the charging and discharging cycle. Lithium ion batteries don't do that. They don't off gas as they're operating under normal conditions. So if they're starting to off gas, it means that something is going wrong. And having off gas detection is a great way of knowing then, you know, oops, something's going on. Got to shut the system off. Got to isolate it. Um, and then respond once it's you know at a, at a point where you can respond to it. Temperature monitoring is also a key piece here. So a lot of these advanced systems have a temperature monitor that's built into it to make sure that you know as it's potentially starting to enter thermal runaway and it's heating up, you can monitor that and respond to it. Um, smoking gas detection, exhaust, and deflagration venting; those are really important things. Once the system starts smoking or giving off that gas and starts building up there. Um, there's ways that you can mitigate any potential for real damages by having exhaust built into the system. So whether that's like HVAC or deflagration venting panels, which will actually give out once there's any buildup of pressure in the system, um, those are good options for you know making sure that you're not going to have a, an opportunity for an explosive event. Um, Many of you may have seen, you know, there have been incidents of fires and explosions with batteries in years past and even still to this day, but um, not in New York. Uh, where we've seen those happen have been places where they don't have updated fire codes, where you don't have to have all of these systems in place to make sure that you can minimize, you know, any potential risks of a battery system. So you're in luck by, by living in New York and having you know, the people much smarter than I who have driven the code update cycles. We're, we're really fortunate to have these great codes in place in New York State. Um, and there's other, you know, uh, there's other um, requirements that you can have in place. These are other considerations that can help uh, minimizing the risk of um, you know, propagation of thermal runaway, but it's really the venting and exhaust, it's the gas detection, it's the fire suppression and smoke detection. Those are really the things that you're going to want to make sure are addressed in the site plan um, with regard to fire safety. Now, I've talked about UL 9540A a little bit. That's that testing again. That's what they do. It's not to test whether the systems will catch on fire. It's going to test what's going to happen if they do, you know, enter thermal runaway. Um, and so those are often projects that are getting tested down to the cell level. Um, up through cell, module, unit, and installation level testing for 9548 compliance. And so you want to make sure, as the code does, and as our model law does, you want to make sure that you are requiring applicants to be bringing you only their best and finest projects, which means projects that have been, are, are using components that have been UL 9548 listed. So in the uniform code for New York State, that includes a few different things. Um, in 2020, the uniform code cycle for 2020 went into effect, which means that there is now battery protections included in the residential code, the building code, and the fire code, which are applicable without the need for local adoption. We've talked about that. So for residential code, that means a few different things. There's size and separation requirements. Um, and there's also rules around where you can actually put those in the home. So they're allowable in attached or detached garages or exterior walls or within utility closets within the home, but you can't be sticking these things in you know, your closet next to the kitchen. You can't be putting this in your bedroom. They have to be in defined spaces that are up to code. Um, you can have 20 kilowatt hours per unit. So if any of you are familiar with like a Tesla power wall, such as that, which is pictured here on the bottom right, those are, I believe around 14 kilowatt hours per unit. 
And so you're technically able to have a few of those. You can aggregate up to 40 or 80 kilowatt hours, depending on where this system is actually being um, installed in the home. So if it's outside and away from the home and you've got separation between the system and the home, you can have it be you know, up to 80 kilowatt hours. If it's inside, usually it's up to 40 or 60, depending on the installation location. Um, and then there's other requirements that are in place in terms of fire resistance rating for the area where you're installing this and protection from vehicle impact for projects that are going in a garage. Um, all of those are, are uh, requirements that are very clearly spelled out in the uniform code. So again, we think it's perfectly acceptable to adopt a streamlined permitting process in your zoning law for these tier one systems, particularly for residential, because there are really good requirements that are in place in the uniform code um, and in the, the, the New York State residential code to ensure that your systems are going to be installed safely, assuming that your code enforcement official is able to, you know, utilize the resources that are out there and ensure that, you know, everything is up to up to code. Um, it's really, it's really great and it's very detailed stuff. In fact, I think some people would make the case that it makes it too hard for residential installations of energy storage systems. Um, I appreciate where they're coming from, but our number one priority is safety. And I think that this code is a really good opportunity to ensure that we have safety while still giving an option for residential installations. As you get to the larger systems above 600 kilowatt hours, this is where you start seeing um, some additional stringent requirements that are already in place about the need for local adoption. So hazard mitigation analysis is gonna be required for any large system above the 600 kilowatt hour threshold. And it tells you everything that can happen if something were to go wrong with this battery. You know, what happens if someone drives their car into it? What happens if it's a, you know, 100 degrees outside and the AC stops, the, the HVAC stops working? Um, it's supposed to tell you exactly what the you know, failure pathways are for this battery and what would happen if anything were to happen to it. And you're able to you know, provide approvals for hazard mitigation analysis if they're demonstrating that they've got the components in place as part of their installation to contain and control any uh, you know, bad, act, bad things that would happen if any of those failure modes were to come, come, to, uh, come to light. And then there's large scale fire testing, which I've mentioned as 9540A. So large scale fire testing means that any system over 600 kilowatt hours in the state of New York has to complete its 9540A testing or an approved equivalent. To my knowledge, there is no approved equivalent yet. So it's 9540A testing that they have to do. Uh, it doesn't mean that other testing labs aren't going to develop other testing methodologies that are comparable, but to my knowledge, UL 9540A is the only game in town. And again, it's not gonna demonstrate that a fire will never happen. The point of 9540A is to demonstrate that if a fire were to happen, it will be contained and that the system has everything it needs in place to make sure that it's not gonna spread and cause you know, further incidents. Um, testing will inform you know, any necessary precautions in terms of space between these installations and buildings or you know, other, other considerations like that. Um, there are other places in the code where the local code enforcement official has the opportunity to augment or alleviate some requirements based on a projects having completed these testing. So I'll give you a couple of examples. There are two companies, one in New York and I believe one based in Connecticut, that have designed battery energy storage systems that are, uh, they feature an anti-propagation design, meaning every battery cell or each module, for instance, is contained such that it literally cannot propagate from one cell to another. And so if they're able to demonstrate to you that, you know, it's literally impossible for you to set my system on fire and have it propagate from cell to cell, it is as safe as it can be. Well, then the code does give you the option of alleviating some of the requirements to make it easier to install those systems. And it's really just meant to, you know, reward those developers and those equipment manufacturers that are designing products that can meet these high safety standards. Uh, some of the other relevant requirements in the fire code include around fire remediation, where the system owner has to provide a team that is able to relieve first responders um, and monitor the system if and when something were to happen to the project. I've mentioned this a couple of times, but there's a peer review requirement to make sure that your code enforcement official is not going through this alone and your planning board is not going through this alone, but the developer of a large scale project will have to provide a third party independent reviewer um, to help the municipality review the project. 
We've talked about the commissioning plan, which includes operation and maintenance, as well as um, you know the actual step-by-step -step process for them putting this project up and, and getting it connected to the grid and getting it online. Um, there's also the decommissioning plan requirement that is included as part of the uniform code as well, which we talked about earlier. Now, I mentioned towards the beginning that there are technology specific requirements in the code, and that means it's depending on the, the battery chemistry um, that will inform the characteristics of operation and failures for that battery, and thus it informs what requirements are in place for the technology. So you're not going to treat a lead acid battery the same way that you're going to treat a lithium ion battery or a flow battery because they're different technologies and they have different profiles. So on the left, you can see the sections of the code that compliance may or may not be required for, and then I'll focus on the lithium ion battery uh, column. But some of these categories include exhaust ventilation, spill control and neutralization, explosion control, safety caps, thermal runaway. So for lithium ion batteries, you can see that you don't need to worry about exhaust control or exhaust ventilation and spill control rather, because during normal operations, a lithium ion battery does not off gas the way a nickel cat or a lead acid battery does. It also doesn't need spill control because a lithium ion battery does not contain liquid electrolyte in the quantity that a flow battery does or a lead acid battery does. Um, these are using like a lithium ion salt. It's not metallic lithium and it's not a large amount of liquid electrolyte. So you don't need to worry about that. However, you do need to have explosion control in place because again, if something were to happen, if it enters a failure mode and starts to produce you know, flammable gases and those gases can build up, it can lead to an explosion hazard if you do not have ventilation in place. Um, and then thermal runaway we've talked about, but we know that that's a characteristic of lithium ion batteries, much like it is other chemistries as well. Um, I hope I'm not scaring people too much, but it's really, these are more relevant for like these large scale systems. And again, you know, many of your municipalities may not ever see a large battery system proposed in the community, but if you get one, you want to make sure that you're prepared to permit and review that application as best as you can. Um, there's also location specific requirements in the code as well. So we have different requirements for indoor versus outdoor installations. And then within each of those categories, there, categories there's different requirements for dedicated and non-dedicated use buildings. So for example, is it the battery room within a different commercial building or is it a separate building that is only built to house batteries, much like a data center would be for you know, computers. Um, if it's a dedicated use building and you don't have actual lives at, at stake because there aren't you know, other people that are working in the building, then the requirements are gonna be different. Similarly for outdoor installations, you know, see on the bottom left is an example of an installation that is in a parking lot that's providing services for a community solar project located on the roof of a big box chain. That's gonna be considered outdoor near exposures, meaning that you have, you're in a parking lot, it's a public parking lot. And even though it's fenced off and no one can like hit it with their car, you're still near, you know, people that are going shopping, you're in a parking lot. And so that's gonna have different requirements as opposed to an outdoor remote system, like the one on the bottom right, which is an example of a project in the capital region in New York, which is providing grid services and is very far away from, you know, the public. Um, and so you don't need to have all of the same requirements because if something were to go wrong, it's not gonna pose the same risk to human life. Talked a little bit about the battery management system earlier, but again, um, these are the, the eyes, ears, brains. Oops, sorry about that. What happened to my presenter view? There we go. Um, these are the eyes, ears, and brains of, of our battery systems. Um, and you wanna make sure that, you know, these are constantly monitoring the state of health for your battery and can disconnect the, the system as it needs to. And that's covered in the, the uniform code as well. Um, I got a few more slides to run through, but I wanna be just mindful that we will have, you know, some time for questions. So please, as we're going through this, feel free to, you know, throw some questions in the chat or think about some questions. We'll have an opportunity to, uh, to go through those in just a minute. Um, sort of talked about what those different installations look like. So a dedicated use building versus a non-dedicated use building where batteries are just in a separate battery room within the same building versus, you know, a warehouse that's built solely to house batteries. Um, 
An example of a remote installation might be like an outdoor system that's paired with a solar or wind farm. Um, meaning it's, you know, not necessarily located near, you know, residences or near commercial uh, buildings, but it's, uh, you know, more than 100 feet away or more than, you know, a few hundred feet away uh, versus outdoor near exposures where, you know, for instance, like down in New York City, we're seeing installations that are happening on, you know, commercial roofs or in parking structures where you're really needing to be thinking about public safety because of the exposure that you have around that battery. Um, one thing that we've seen in terms of talking about different installation types, um, walk-in units whereby people are converting shipping containers to mainly be, you know, uh, battery containers. Uh, these are really interesting opportunities because it alleviates the need for, you know, housing these indoors where you actually have people in the installation or in the battery room or in the battery facility. Um, these walk-in units are much more easier to access um, and you really only need to go in there if and when you need to do maintenance on the system. Otherwise, you won't have people going, you know, in and out of the, the, the walk-in unit. Um, so maybe you guys have seen these proposed, maybe not, but um, we've seen, you know, examples like this one here where you can see there's a number of shipping container style units. Um, I apologize for the small size of the picture, but these are large HVAC systems that are included on top of each unit, which is circulating air and relieving, you know, any buildup of any gases if something were to go wrong. Um, and they're all housed neatly in these shipping containers, which is very cool. Um, cabinets, these are examples of the Tesla Power Pack. Um, which is sort of their mid-size installation. And you can have these cabinets as standalone, meaning like one of these cabinets, or you can string these together as a cabinet system, which is, you know, right here, you can see it's 10 Tesla power packs all wrapped up in one pretty package with a bow on it, which can be used to provide larger, you know, serve larger load, whether it's like a larger commercial operation or a, a commercial customer or something like that. Uh, just a couple, a couple more slides here. Um, for outdoor installations, you have to have certain clearance to exposures, uh, which is greater than 10 feet from lot lines or public ways. Um, and you can reduce that from 10 feet to lower if you need to um, by demonstrating compliance with that 9540A testing again. And so that is all up to the jurisdiction. Um, the code enforcement official has the power to you know, change some of these requirements based on the uh, developer demonstrating that their project does not pose a risk. They haven't demonstrated that, then you can you know increase the uh, the amount of protections that you need. Um, this is particularly for um, residential outdoor systems, but you know we often see for residential systems they're trying to put them in a garage, or you want to put them in a basement, um, or you want to put them in an outdoor installation on the wall. I'd say that outdoor installations are less relevant for New York because we have a little thing known as the Northeast winter that, you know, places like California and Arizona don't have to deal with where outdoor installations can make more sense. But all this goes to say that, you know, there are requirements that are in place for a system that's being installed in the residence or at a commercial operation. Um, if you want to install them outdoors on the wall, there's also different requirements for outdoor installations that are on the ground as well. Um, the material that we've covered this evening in the battery storage guidebook, including the model law, which does, you know, it, it is more robust than everything we've covered today, but I wanted to make sure we covered the, the sort of introductory fire safety pieces. Um, all of this is accessible on the Clean Energy Siting Team's homepage, which is www.nyserta.ny.gov slash siting. Um, if you click on energy storage guidebook alongside the other guidebooks and resources that we have here, you can access these individual chapters, whether it's the model law, including a Word document version that you can actually go in and customize. Um, there's also the, uh, the unified permit and the inspection checklist for code enforcement officials and building inspectors, which are available as part of that um, guidebook as well. And then there's the aggregation of all of the code uh, citations from the uniform code, including the residential and fire code that are available there for your code enforcement officials. Um, you can reach out to us through our, our email here, again, cleanenergyhelp at nyserta.ny.gov. We're able to provide a number of things, including these resources, as well as technical assistance if you have an actual project that you're looking for help reviewing, or if you're looking to adopt a model law and you want us to like, you know, come speak to your planning board at large or come you know, provide some commentary during a meeting with an applicant, we're more than happy to try our best to help. Uh, feel free to reach out to request assistance uh, using one of these links here or sending us an email um, and with that, 
I have just been talking a lot, a lot, a lot. We've got about 15 minutes left. Um, so I'm happy to take any and all questions. Um, if you guys have anything that you want me to go back to throughout this presentation, I'm happy to. Otherwise, let's talk. Let's do, uh, let's do questions. Thank and you I'm very going much, to Ian. Stop sharing so I can see everyone's faces here, but I'm happy to pull it back up if, uh, if and when that could be helpful. Sounds great. So thank you. That was very, very informative, very robust. So thank you um, very much for that training. Um, I do have a couple of questions that have come up. First, I do want to mention that I also included the direct link to the battery energy storage systems guidebook in the chat. Um, so that would take you directly to the, um, the guidebook itself off of the website that uh, Ian just posted in the uh, um, the presentation itself. So, um, and if for whatever reason, you leave here tonight and you say, oh God, I forgot to write down that link. Um, you can Google or you can give us a call, um, OSC, uh, Office of Sustainable Energy or at Planning, we'll make sure that we get the information to you. Um, so getting to the questions, is there training and standard operating procedures for local fire departments, which are mostly volunteers? Incredibly good question. And it's one that I have a less good answer to, but the answer is getting better. Um, so the answer is kind of. Um, there are some trainings that are available, um, mostly in terms of like fire code, um, less so in terms of operating procedures. So we are working with our colleagues at the, um, the OFPC, the Office of Fire Prevention and Control, which is, is part of the Department of uh, Home, is it DHS, the New York DHS, I believe it is. So they're the, they're the ones who do all of the trainings for first responders, including volunteer fire companies across the state. Um, we are working with them to develop actual incident response training for our first responders across the state that can be standardized. Until that is available, the best resource for training is going to be from project developers who are required to provide training for first responders as part of the uniform code. Um, so what that doesn't mean is like it's, it's not as good for providing proactive training as in before a project is even proposed in the community. But once a project is, you know, looking at your community and has even maybe started to go through the application process, you can make sure that they are being required to provide trainers to work with the local fire companies to make sure that they are trained in incident response for the system. Um, so as of now, there's no standardized course that's being offered as part of our training through the OFPC. We are working to develop that between NYSERDA, OFPC, and some of our consultants that are fire safety experts. So. I hope to have a better answer for you in terms of like a course that's available right now. Um, we're not there yet, but we will be soon. Um, next question for at least the large systems, is there much computer software involved? And if so, are they subject to hacking and threats of remote shutdowns of the system? That's a great question. Um, absolutely, computer software is involved. So that battery management system, I think a lot of that, because it's able to, you know, monitor the system down to the cell level and then triage to the owner operator as needed. Um, it is very sophisticated computer software um, and it is very active and it is very, uh, as any computer is, it is susceptible to, you know, cyber attacks. Um, I don't have, you know, I'm not really an expert in terms of that, but I know that, you um, you know, much like with pipelines in the past, energy, critical energy infrastructure is absolutely a, you know, cyber cyber attacks that are a huge consideration there. Um, I'm not the, the best expert in terms of the cybersecurity uh, strength of these systems, but I will say that I am not familiar with any um, incidents that have happened in terms of cybersecurity with energy storage systems specifically. Um, but I can guarantee you that every system manufacturer, every software developer probably has that as like their number one concern and is making sure that their systems are up to speed. Um, so definitely a concern and it's something that I would definitely recommend that you are raising with developers that are proposing projects in their town. I think that it would make a lot of sense to include that as a requirement for, you know, site plan documentation or special use permit approval that they, you know, address the cybersecurity risks to their project as part of their presentation of the project to the town. It's a really good question. Excellent. I'm, not gonna, any... I'm gonna make a note of that. So I make sure that we address that in uh, in our resources. So thank I you. I was just going to say, that. see, you know, we're, we're this is a two way street here. So we're learning from you and you're taking something back yeah. to NYSERDA from us. So that's great. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I think, you know, one, one of the things I didn't mention here is like these resources are living and breeding documents. You know, these can these technologies are relatively new. And so we're trying to make sure that we're updating 
our, our model laws and our resources to make sure that they are reactive and responsive to you know what our communities are dealing with across the state. I just did a very large update to our model solar law throughout the last year. It took a really long time, um, but we're we're always looking to you know update these resources. We're we're trying to keep best best practices you know for for our communities across the state. So. If not now, if there's other questions that come up or things that you think we missed, please let us know. Uh, we have no no ego about it. We want to just make sure that we're we're doing the best that we can for our community. So I'm going to write that down now. Okay. So seeing no additional questions, um, I do want to just say, you know, thank you everyone to for their participation tonight. Um, and we did have some very good questions that came through. I think we could all learn from it. Um, oh. Wait, I see one more. Is New York State screening batteries manufactured in China and elsewhere where quality control is an issue? It's a really good question. Um, I mean, so there's sort of two, there's sort of two pieces to that. Um, there's like the high level trade relationships between, you know, the US or New York State and, you know, China. It's not just China as well. There's also batteries manufactured in, you know, Southeast Asia and in the Korea. Um, I think, uh, in fact, a lot of the lithium ion batteries are from battery manufacturers in South Korea. So it's definitely not just China. Um, the state itself and like communities themselves, it's kind of hard to police, you know, consumer electronics, um, especially again, because like the, the types of batteries that we've seen and used in like hoverboards and scooters, which have caused a lot of fires that happens all the time. Um, those are like really low quality types of batteries that are not the same that are used from these uh, reputable manufacturers that are you know, being used like LG and others in these energy storage systems. Um, so the state is not screening you know, individual battery manufacturers, but I think the best thing that you can be doing is only you know, allowing developers to put in projects in your town that are using batteries that are certified to the high safety standards that are in place through a uniform code. And so that means, you know, 9540A, developers that have gone through that have gone through rigorous testing and spent hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars on equipment to get their certifications. Um, shoddy manufacturers from China are not going to have their 9540A requirements. They're not going to be listed to 9540 and NFPA 55 and these other requirements that are in place. So. We are not, you know, at least I'm not responsible for individually screening manufacturers or products. Um, but I think that you can make sure that your developers and project owners are replying, supplying all of the relevant information to the town when they're, you know, giving you their specifications and showing you their credentials in terms of the standards that they've met. So I just want to make sure um, that there's no more questions coming in right now. It doesn't look like it. Um, and I want to uh, genuinely just thank you very much, Ian, for joining us tonight. Um, I see Ian just posted his email address in the chat as well. So um, if everyone wants to take an opportunity to just jot that information down as well, um, you know, please feel free to access the resources that are available. To my knowledge, we don't have any um, battery storage projects at this time proposed in Sullivan County. Um, what I do know is that we have received information and I've seen notifications that there is a potential um, transmission line uh, underground going down the uh, existing Marcy South um, uh, right of way, um, which I think we're, we're all kind of familiar where, where Marcy South is. And my, uh, I guess my one question is, if we see this additional um, uh, transmission capacity coming into Sullivan County, does that open the door and possibly, um, you know, allow for these larger battery projects to want to site in this location, or is that going to be um, kind of a, a separate issue? It's a good question. Um... I would say that like of all of the places that I think would be eyed for large scale storage that, you know, some place along the, the transmission line is probably not as likely as places that are closer where it's paired with the generation itself or paired closer to, you know, critical like load, high, high load centers, I think are more common. Um, it's not to say it's impossible because there is value to be added to the grid at large by putting batteries anywhere along the distribution or transmission network, because again, you know, if 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 uh, 
congestion relief is, you know, maybe that's what the battery is. That's the, the value add that that installation is serving. Well, that can be done anywhere, right? So if you have a, a place on the grid where there's a lot of congestion, you have a lot of like solar or solar wind that's feeding, um, you know, to that grid at that point, well, then it can make sense to have a battery there. Um, but generally speaking, I'd see you say you're, you're normally seeing installations either again paired with generation or like adjacent to critical high load centers. So I would say it doesn't inherently mean that you're more likely to see batteries, but it also it's more likely that you will than if you hadn't seen the transmission line upgraded there. Um, so hard to say with certainty, but okay. All right. Well, I hope um, you all found this enlightening and maybe we'll consider um, getting something on the books um, sooner than later in your municipalities. Um, you know, being proactive is uh, certainly um, something that we would strongly encourage. And with that, I will just say to Cassandra, do you have any additional information that we need to pass along to our participants for tonight? Um, just that we will be downloading this recording and adding it to the county's YouTube channel. Um, so stay tuned for that. The solar comp or the comp plan, my sort of training that we did last month is also on the county's YouTube channel. If you'd like to access that, you can't get credit, but it was a really great training. Um, and yeah, so keep your eye out for links. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Ian, so much. Uh, I think we all learned a lot. And if you have any other additional questions, follow up with either Heather Brown, myself, or Ian, and those certificates will be out in the next two weeks. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, everybody.